looks like we're live. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another Zuzin session. Hello, hello. So uh, let's make a little bit of an announcement and officially start the stream. So let me bring my Discord server, which is a little bit lagging right now. Uh, so hello, hello everyone. I'm really glad to see you all. So red I wanted red circle, but I got red car. Okay, so live on Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch.television? Today we're doing game dev and Jai, right? So I still want to continue developing the Jai break game uh, that I started, you know, some time ago, right? Uh, this is how it looks like. You can find the source code of this thing here. I'm going to post it in the chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, eventually, I don't know when, when I'm going to publish all of that because I have a huge uh, backlog. Uh, you will find that in the description, hopefully. I don't know if I don't lose the description file, right? So I have shed ton of description files, right? So maybe I'll lose something at some point. Who knows? Uh, right. So, and let me give the link to the twitch.tv uh, slash starting. And I'm going to ping everyone who's interested in being pinged by the way the uh, you know role assignment bot is actually fixed so if you go to roles and just click on pinged it will assign pinged role to you so you don't have to worry about that I should probably convert announcement channel to the announcement channel right so the discord supports that because people were coming up with their own solutions but I'm a boomer I don't know how to use discord so I'm sorry <laughs> I'm also afraid that I'm going to break something and waste my time. So the, the current system works. And as an experienced programmer, I know that if something works, you better don't touch it. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So let's take a look at the game. Let's take a look at the game. I don't think I actually was developing anything for that game uh, off screen. So I haven't streamed for like several days and uh, for the whole time I was working on my bot, right, for the chat bot. I'm currently rewriting my chat bot and go to, um, you know, simplify maintenance because the current bot was written in Haskell and Haskell is a pain in the ass to maintain. Uh, if somebody tells you otherwise, they're lying. They're lying because they're brainwashed by Haskell propaganda. So... Okay, hello, hello. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Haskell is one of those languages that is developed by mathematicians, but the problem with mathematicians is that they're not really great software developers. They're great mathematicians, but they're not great software developers, which means uh, Haskell is a beautiful and elegant language. And I'm saying that ironically. It is a beautiful and elegant language that is pain in the ass to use because it's not engineered properly, right? So things like Cabal and Stack, they're just like so fucking painful. The packaging is painful. Like everything related to software part, the actual software part in Haskell is fucking painful. But the language itself is beautiful. And you can clearly see that it's created by mathematicians. They're great mathematicians, right? So they created beautiful language, but they couldn't engineer it properly. So <laughs> it's so frustrating because I want to use Haskell. I like Haskell, but it's just like implementations are pain in the ass. So uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Where do you host your bot on that laptop? <laughs> Because I can't pay for virtual private servers, so I have my own real server. Yes, this is a this is a data center, right? So, and this is this is a server. And I'm not joking. Well, the the bot that is currently answering the the project commands, it's it's sitting there. Uh, so best data center. So I also have a couple of uh, routers right and i'm thinking to actually change their uh, firmware and also connect them to to the cluster <laughs> i don't know anyway so uh let's take a look at the game right so this is a jailbreak and uh i think on the previous stream we were working specifically on meta programming right so uh, i know that people told me that there is like a built-in uh thing in jai to reload the configuration files and stuff like that but they decided to make my own one because i want to at least learn how to do meta programming in jai otherwise i won't learn anything right so and this project is for learning right so I wonder if I still have any changes. Mm, okay, so let me let me see. So here are the changes, and 
Mm -mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let me just go ahead and try to compile it and see whatever it will tell me. Uh, is it software? I don't quite remember. I think it's OPT. Uh, Bin Jai. And I'm going to do, I, I think I have to do first J, right? So because now we have a build script, right? I'm running a build script that then builds the actual, uh, you know, the actual program, which we then uh, can run. So I'm going to do J break. And there you go. So here is the game, right? So here's the game. This is how it looks like. Uh, okay. So to refresh, what I want you to have is I want you to have this file. Uh, with configuration, right? So this is a file with configuration and I want to be able to dynamically reload that configuration. As you can see, uh, currently I have a lot of configuration parameters and they're all hard-coded, right? Uh, but I want to be able to reload them. So I'm slowly moving them into a separate file and also have a, uh, I want to have an option that um, when I'm ready to do a release, I want to actually strip off anything related to hot reloading, right? And bake those constant, constants into the, uh, into the final program. Right, so, and that's basically what we were working on, and um, here we created a simple meta program that at build time uh, parses the um, the param.conf and generates like everything that you need to generate in here. So, and it managed to generate like a constant stuff, right? So it's generating constant stuff, but I also want to be able to have the dynamic hot reloading stuff. <clears throat> hot reloading stuff and maybe this is what I'm gonna be working on right now I think that's a very interesting idea yeah I think it's a very interesting idea so essentially uh, move all of that parsing stuff into a separate module that can be reused by runtime as well yeah that's a cool thing you can reuse the same code for building and for the runtime if you want to that's actually pretty cool so I think that's what I'm going to do. Mm, I like the font you use for the game text. You can find this font in a uh, fonts folder. It's called uh, Allegrea. I hope I pronounce it correctly, but yeah, it's called Allegrea. And it's uh, under OFL. So it's sort of like a free like open source license for fonts. And you can find this font on GitHub in here. So uh, I'm going to actually put it in here. Can you Zeke do that? I'm pretty sure Zeke can do that. I just like didn't learn how to do that. Uh, all right, so the font I use for the game, right? It's actually a pretty cool font, specifically for the game. It just like fits really, really well. Um, okay. <laughs> So, and of course you can find it in the source code. The source code of the game is open and here is the font, right? So it comes with the game. Um, so, all right. So, params dot j. Uh, I challenge Sodium to create their own broadcasting software like OBS written in Zeek. Well, people had to donate to me $300 just for me to check Zeek, because this is how much I didn't want to do that. Are you sure you have enough money to actually force me to write anything serious in it? 300 bucks just to check it. Just, just check it. Just hello world. 300 bucks. Are you sure you have enough money for OBS? Think about that. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, anyway. <clears throat> so, it's not about the challenge. It's just like I don't want to do that. I have better things to do with my life. Uh, okay, so what I want to do, right, so I want to move everything related to parameter parsing into a separate module, right, so I already created a file called params.j, right, so, and let's go ahead and just like literally move everything there. So first we have a param, uh, right, so here is a param, 
So it's a structure, it contains the name and contains the value. So this is the uh, the types that we support right now, right? So we, we also have a simple function that accepts a line and turns it into a parameter, right? So it also has a boolean and stuff like that. Um, oh, by the way, do you guys remember how I had a problem when I confused the order of params and boolean? Uh, so uh, Jonah, as far as I know, he already fixed it today on the stream. So this is actually super cool uh, because I reported that bug to like via email and he accepted it and he fixed it today. So the next beta is going to be fixed. So cool. I'm contributing to the language. I'm actually contributing to the language. Holy shit. Wow. Um. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, let's uh, continue. So I'm going to take this thing. A and the problem with that thing was, uh, I wonder if I can demonstrate that. Uh, right, so if I remember correctly. So test the agile. Right, so main something, something like this. So essentially, if you had a structure, right? So let's define, I don't know, foo. Right, so this is a structure. Uh, struct. And if you have something that constructs that structure, right, and that something returns not only the structure, but also like a Boolean, right? So I think, I think there's something like a Boolean. And if you return it, uh, like so, and then you make that structure. So you do foo, okay, and you do make. And then you can check if not okay, you want to report an error, right? So maybe I'm going to do that. I keep forgetting that I don't have to put curly braces in here because I've been programming in Go for the past like several uh, several days. So Go doesn't allow you to do things like that, which is sometimes convenient syntactically, but uh, Jaya allows you to do that. So this is a failed. Um, right. And here we probably want to import basic, right? So it actually in uh, enables the the QBasic support for the language. I don't know, it doesn't. Uh, all right, so let me do test J. All right, everything's fine in here. So semicolon, it wants a semicolon. Uh, what else does it want? It's not a function, right? It's not a function. And as you can see, it compiles. But if you accidentally uh, confuse the order of the return, uh, return parameters, it will tell you something really weird. It will tell you that uh, exclamation mark is not a declared identifier. So, and that is extremely confusing. And the reason why it tells you that is because the exclamation mark is overloaded, right? It is overloaded and it's not defined for the structure, right? But the error message itself is extremely confusing. So John already fixed that today. Uh, so the next beta should be, should be fine. So which is, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> I've only just recently started doing anything in Lua for video game wiki. I don't know anything about it. Uh, it's basically JavaScript, uh, but with a Pascal syntax. So that's everything you need to know about Lua. Though type system of Lua is better than the JavaScript system, so it's stronger, right? Actually, if we took JavaScript today and replaced it with Lua, we would be in a better place just because of the better type system. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. So here are the parameters, and let's also move the function, right? So the reason why I remember that example is because it's like literally a similar example in here. So this function depends on this import, so I'm gonna put it in here. Uh, and I wonder if I have to actually do it here as well. No, I don't have to. Okay, that's perfect. And maybe in here. Okay, so let me try to compile the entire thing and see where it is going to complain. Right, so it complains about uh, not having parse parameters. Okay, so I can do quite easily import uh, param, right, and hopefully it will find everything. Is it called param? Do I have to call it param? Uh, okay, so is it like small? Okay, so search pad. Oh, this is actually so cool. Unable to load a module called params in any of the module directories, right? So search path is this. So I suppose we have like several options. 
I know there in J instead of import, you can do a thing called load, uh, which essentially works li like an, an, an include, right? So in C, C, C++, you have include, and it just like takes the entire file and includes it in here. Uh, but import like creates a separate module. I don't know for sure, right? But yeah. So I suppose for load, we don't have to modify the search path. Let me, let me actually try that. And I think that was true. That was absolutely true, so I didn't have to modify the, the include path. So, but to modify the search path, I probably would have to um, uh, use compile time parameters, right? So, and I don't really want to learn about them right now. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, we have parameters in here. Um, and what's interesting is that I want to maybe uh, abstract out this process. You see, this process is really interesting because it just iterates line by line and then does something with that line. But at the same time, I want to make this part parameterizable, right? So right now, in the, at, the, at the compile time, what we do, we simply add the parameter into the, into the build. Right, we just use add build string. But maybe if you're doing runtime stuff, you want to do something different. For instance, add it to the to the hash table, right? Which which makes sense, right? So at runtime, you want to be able to move it to the hash table. So what we can do here, we can probably extract that to a separate function that is parameterized by a lambda. So we're going to be doing a functional programming in J. Hmm? Do we have any functional programming fans in here? Where are, where are all the people who ask me for more Haskell videos? Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, yeah. So, let's actually try to quickly do that. Mm, so, uh, probably going to do it like this. Um, so, parse param. So, um, it's actually called parse params. Right, so parse params and uh, just define this as a function. So, and the way I'm going to factor out this entire stuff is simply by taking this entire piece of code and copy pasting it in here, right? But then you'll have to figure out what parameters do we have to put, uh, right? Uh, do we have to define for this function for it to work? I don't have to do that, right? Because I have a statically typed compiled language and that statically typed compiled language can tell me what I need to add to the parameters. So I can just do something like that. And as you can see, it tells me, okay, you don't have param params content. So let's just, you know, accept it as a parameter in here, right? So something like that. There you go. You see how easy it is? You see how easy it is? Uh, so we also have params file path, but here's the thing. Params file path is a cons uh, constant right is a constant that just needs to be defined some way here so it has to be a global contest constant constant so we also don't have a workspace right so we probably also have to put it in here so uh work space but i don't know its type all right so what is the type of the workspace is it just um workspace like this i think that's what it is Right, this is a workspace. Mm, mismatching level of indirection. Um, oh, because it's not a interesting workspace is not a structure, it's an ID. All right, so that's actually pretty cool. Okay, and surprisingly, this entire thing works, and I don't understand why. I think I do understand why, because I never called this function. So the only thing I need to do now is just call this function with uh, params content, right? So there we go. So this is a params content. And uh, as you can see, this is how easily I took the chunk of code and extracted it to a separate function. And again, I want to be able to uh, essentially um, parameterize this piece of code, right? I want to parameterize it somehow. So that means I probably want to um, accept, I want to accept some sort of a function in here. Um, Accept some sort of a function into which I'm going to pass the param. So let's actually quickly try to do that. Uh, so this is going to be something like this. Uh, and maybe I'm going to call it uh, walk 
params, right? So this is a walk params. And we're going to have a, a function called visit. And I'm going to try to guess, I'm going to try to guess how you uh, syntactically define lambdas, right? So you probably do something like this, right? So this is going to be param and it shouldn't probably return anything, right? Uh, you know what, I'm going to go to the examples and I'm going to just check the examples and see if they, you know, have anything. Uh, because I'm not sure. Uh, lambda, not, it's not examples, it's how to. Okay, lambda, anonymous. Mm -hmm. Okay. No example for lambdas, all right. Uh, so I remember the lambdas actually have uh, stuff related to bake and this is uh, probably something that we'll have to learn right so uh let me try to do that okay so usually people do something like or maybe not not the bake mm, i don't even know is it no that's none of the existing name actually uh easily to find um anonymous procedure okay so the same as saying f is anonymous procedure uh-huh wait okay so this is how you define okay okay this is the anonymous procedure this is the lambda itself right so and then if we take a look at call with it's a function. Okay, so the, they didn't have a type for that specifically, unfortunately. Uh, okay, okay. So structs. Um, yikes! That's the only thing I can say. Yikes! Though I have a different approach to that, right? So maybe going like a functional programming route is not particularly great right so it's not particularly great because you wanna how is that you want to actually do something like in immediate style mode yeah i think something like that immediate style mode would be actually better uh where you have begin parameters you begin parsing parameters right um then you query the next parameter until you ran out of them and then you close the entire thing i think that would be uh, way better right you know how you do immediate ui stuff right so immediate style parsing is actually a little bit better than functional style one with lambdas and stuff like that mm -mm. so i think i want to go that route a dead marshal hello 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 welcome 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 how are you guys doing why are you so quiet today uh, to to mm, 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 mm. hello hello so we have a couple of subscriptions uh gd new man thank you so much for the witch prime subscription thank you thank you thank you really appreciate that uh columbetka hello what's up what's up what's up mm -mm. All right, so let me try to actually do that. All right, first jailbreak. Um, yeah, so essentially, as you can see here, we have the state of the parsing, right? So this is the state of the parsing, and this is where we can put it, right? So we can take the state and turn it into a structure, right? So something like params uh, parser, right? Params parser, and this is going to be a struct. So in here, um, in here, we're going to um, have the content, right? So this is the content that is going to be simply a string. And then we're also going to have a line number, right? So, and I suppose it's going to be simply an integer, um, right? And then we're going to have some sort of a function, uh, next param, right? Next param. Mm -mm next param next param it will accept the uh, params parser probably by a pointer right so we're going to call it pp and it will return the next parameter and also maybe a boolean indicating that it's done parsing things but we also want to be able to indicate that uh, there is an error 
right? There is some sort of a like syntactical error in here. So that means here we have two situations, either end of file or um, invalid parameter. So maybe for that, we need to come up with some sort of enumeration, right? So end of file and um, invalid, right? Something like this. In both of the cases, by the way, we want to stop the iteration. Mm -mm. Right. In both of the cases, we want to do that. And also we need enumeration that indicates that everything is fine. Right. So maybe we're going to have OK and the file and invalid. Right. There is at least three situations in here. So and we can have something like params failure or maybe PP fail. <laughs> right. So it's going to be PP fail. Uh, maybe not. Params params result right so it's called params result i think it's going to be a little better so params result so this is the next parameter mm -mm. so when do we return end of file right we return when we don't have any content anymore right so if mm -mm. well this one is interesting we also need to be able to skip uh, empty lines, right? So that's one of the things we'll have to do. If content is uh, equal to zero, right? So what we do, we just return, uh, we just return nothing and end of file. That's it. We reached the end of file. Then we want to make this thing, right? So we want to move this entire stuff to here, right? So because that's a single iteration that we'll have to perform. And I'll need to uh, adapt it to, to the entire thing. So this thing is going to be customizable, so we don't need that. Uh, let me just try to compile that and see where it will complain about things. All right, so uh, expect it to write. So it wants something like this in here, right? Then uh, we don't need that stuff anymore. So let's call it parse params. And OK, so pp content. Uh, what was that? Count, right? PP content count. All right. So parse params, too many parameters. Uh -huh. W workspace. Anything else? So, okay, so here's the rest. So this is the content, and this will become rest. Uh, rest, rest, we don't have to do that. So we'll have to reassign pp content and the rest, and then in. Okay. Uh. It's it's by the way it's the middle of the night. If you if you guys didn't know, it's the it's the middle of the night. Welcome to Siberia, motherfuckers. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> um. Uh. So. Yeah. So. So here is the time. Like literally, middle of the night. Um. Mm -mm. Your keyboard to loud neighbors upset. Yeah, probably that's the reason. Uh, okay, so here's the line, and it has to be PP line number. Uh, is not a member of params parser. Oh, because it's called number Namibur. Namibur. Look at that. It's a Namibur. So, but it's super easy to fix. How do you swap a character in Vim? You have to press Escape, then X, and then P. In um, in Emacs, you can swap it by pressing Control T. Easy, okay, easy. Can your Vim do that? I don't think so. I don't freaking think. <clears throat> mm. So if we couldn't parse the parameter, right? If we couldn't parse the parameter. Essentially, what we have to do, we have to return uh, nothing, right? And then return invalid. So if everything went fine, right? If everything went fine, we're going to, I don't know, return 
the param, right? I'm returning the param and the OK. Mm, which is rather interesting. Which makes me think, right? Which makes me, ah, well, I mean, OK, I cannot just return OK. I have to return uh, OK. All right, so that's fine. Mm, all right, that's pretty cool. So that's a pretty simple and straightforward way of doing this entire thing. So you have to create the content, line, line number, and stuff like that. And yeah, that is basically it. <clears throat> Does dot curly braces give you like an, an uninitialized or zero struct or whatever type context requires? Uh, yeah, I think. I think that's what it does. Yeah, so it specifically structs. For arrays, it's gonna be something like this. But for the structs, it's like this. And as far as I know, it's just, uh, not just zero initializes, but it uses the default value, I think. Right, I think that's what it does. I think it just like uses the default values. Because you can specify default values for the structures like this, right? So you can put something like, like this in here, right? I think, I think you can do that. <clears throat> All right, so this is the next parameter. And we also have maybe interesting situation like what if the line is empty, right? What do you do if the line is empty? Uh, well, you won't be able to easily parse that. But maybe we can introduce something like empty, right? Essentially, it's invalid, but it's empty. And maybe this is something that you want to skip. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so it will be kind of cool if next param skipped it automatically, automatically, but that means I'll have to make the logic a little bit more complicated than this. Right. So do I want to make the logic more complicated than this? I'm not quite sure. Right. So because what I need to do in here is uh, split the line, right, and essentially um, also trim the line, if you know what I, mean, what I mean, right? And the question is, how do you trim the line, right? So this is a params, trim, um, yeah, that's what we want to do, like trim, uh -huh. because this thing returns several this thing. Okay, I'm gonna leave it as it is, right? So and if line count is equal zero. You know what, I have a better idea. Uh, so let's actually let all of the empty lines, let all of the empty lines to be invalid. And when we parse things, we're gonna ignore them and maybe uh, put a warning in there. Okay, so we're gonna do it for now like that. Uh, all right, so how are we gonna approach this entire thing? So here's the params content, right? So what I want to do is just pp parser um, params parser, right? So this is a params parser and I'm going to assign the content. You know what would be cool? You know what would be cool? If we had functions like start parsing, which also automatically read the entire file for you, and then stop parsing, which would automatically also clean up after after the file. All right. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, Fungchi, IO monet is not a free monet. Free monet is a completely different thing. Um, free monet is basically a monet that does not perform any effects, but just builds up sort of like an AST, which is then interpreted somewhere later. So it's a completely different uh, approach than, than IO monet. So it's like a completely pure effectless monad that has effects later in uh, by the means of some sort of special interpreter uh, that can perform effects. It's a really useful when you need to have an effect in a code that can't have effects. 
You know what I mean? Right. So the function programming people came up with all sorts of tricks just to not program in a normal programming language, right? So, right. so they, they need to make the code pure for the sake of making it pure. And to do that, they came up with a lot of interesting tricks. They could have just used, you know, a normal programming language, right? But they cannot do that because it's for normies, right? So that's why they need to come up with free moments and stuff like that. That's how it works. <clears throat> Do -do -do -do. Mm. So I just got one question. At what age for how long you've been doing programming? I started the program when I was 16 and I've been programming for 15 years. I've been programming for almost half of my life. Um, just a little bit, just one year, and I'm going to be programming for, yeah, for half of my life, essentially. All right. Mm -mm. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I started at 16 as well. Let me guess, you're 17 now, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, all right. So let's create something like a start parsing. Um, start uh, parsing, right? So, and then here, um, <sighs> rhymes parsing. So here I want to accept file path, right? So here we're accepting file path. And uh, uh, it's probably going to be string, but I keep losing my trail of thoughts. So do I really want to do it right now? Probably, uh, probably not, but that will also require you to do this thing. Okay, that's fine. Uh, param sparse, pp. Um, param sparse, pp. And, oh yeah, you, you can't just do that, right? You can't just do that because then you'll have to initialize it like so. Uh, the content is uh, content params content. Uh, params content, yeah, there we go. And uh, then what we want to do, right? What we want to do? We want to do next param. Uh, pp which will return though what's interesting is that it would be a little bit easier if we returned param via the pointer if you know what i mean but i'm not sure if it's a um, proper idea if you know what i mean so it's a param and then okay right and i want to kind of continue doing this thing while i can right so can I just organize some sort of like in infinite loop, like while true, right? While true, do that. Um, if uh, actually not okay, but result, right? If result is uh, end of file, just simply break. Otherwise, uh, might as well, you know, do something like this. Uh, yep. Case and just break in here. So we have to also put semicolon. Uh, like so, then we're gonna have a case for invalid, right? So we're gonna um, um, we're gonna do it like that. Maybe I'm gonna say something like uh, s. Then why is it so fucking noisy today? I don't understand. Um, <clears throat> All right, so um, invalid, invalid param, invalid param. So maybe it's going to be warning, right? So it's just simply warning. We say this is an invalid param. Uh, params file path, right? 
params file path, and then I'm going to do pp line number. Uh, in case of um, in case of okay, right? In case of okay, we simply do the thing that we're supposed to do in here. We take the parameter tag and uh, just apply this entire stuff, right? So this is the parameter tag. There we go. Might as well maybe do something like this. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, basically like this. So different parameters, different situations. Um, in here, we just do it like that. Mm, cool. So do we want to do anything else? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, we don't have to do parse params anymore. We just need to do next param. Uh -huh. And as you can see, we successfully uh, decoupled the action that you want to do with the parameter from the process of iterating the parameters. You see what I'm talking about? So here is the code that iterates the parameters. And when it encounters the parameter, it just adds it to the compilation. But we want to decouple that. Right. We want you to decouple that so we can just iterate it and then do something else if we need to. Right. So because of that, now we have next param that just takes you the next prime, and then you can do whatever you wanted with it. Right. In case of invalid, so it will just ignore it. And not. So that's basically what I did in here. I decoupled two pieces of code. Right. So this is the uh, architecture lesson for you. Right, you have a piece of code to functionality that is very coupled together, like tightly coupled together, and you just decouple them. Right. So uh, separation of concerns and stuff like that, you know, all of the good stuff. Uh, two, 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 two. All right. So does it make sense? Right. I think I think it makes sense. I think it's a pretty good example of how you separate concerns. Right. Again, I already mentioned you could have done that like two ways. You could have done it functional ways where the function would just accept a lambda. But I think in an imperative language, it is easier to do it like in immediate style. Right. So and in immediate style, you just like have a function that just queries the next parameter, right? Just queries the next parameter and then you handle it. What's interesting is that Jai has iterators, right? And iterators are like macros, right? So they basically expand into the body of the for loop. And I'm thinking, can you turn the params parser into an iterator and then iterate those parameters uh, with a for loop, right? So you take the param parser. Right, you take the param parser and then you just do four, four param in pp, right, or something. I don't know how you do that, like maybe four param in pp. And uh, then every time you encounter OK, it will just do that. I think that's a pretty interesting idea, but I'm not sure how you handle the, uh, the errors in that specific case. Like, like not really sure. Mm, but that's an interesting idea nonetheless. So, yeah. OK, what do you guys think? Is that a good idea? Maybe, maybe it is. All right. So uh, the pointer to take the pointer, you have to do that. And this is the semicolon. And there we go. I think we managed to do that. So I want to try something interesting, right? I want to try to introduce some empty lines in here and see how it will react to that. All right. Did it react to that at all? Uh, I think it didn't react to that because it didn't even call that code, right? So debug is true, and when it's debug, when it's not debug, right? So I think I have to like actually invert that. Yeah, there we go. So as you can see, it doesn't work. I really like that. I have no idea what the fuck is going on in here, right? But it really doesn't work. And the reason is because I'm an idiot, right? So there we go. So it feels like it does not advance the next uh, the next line. As you can see, it always complains about the first line. Actually, it points to the um, to the second one. It just numbers them from zero. So to probably fix that, I need to maybe even take this piece of code and put it in here, right? So the line is plus one. So here we encounter, oh, okay, I see. If we encounter something invalid, it never really uh, advances the rest, but maybe it should. Right, so essentially, as soon as we split something, right, as soon as we split something, we should assign the, uh, the rest of the content, like so, right, which makes sense. Um, and also the question is, 
Maybe it makes sense to do it like that then, but maybe not. Right, so let's actually keep it like that. It is extremely noisy today, I really apologize for that. Funky idea, make a port compiler and jive. Sure, feel free to do that. I don't mind. Mm. What the fuck is going on today? Um, I don't know. Anyway. Okay, so we have that and that. And here we... Okay, so now as you can see... Uh, we have a redeclaration of the variable. So the variable was defined from the generated code, and then here we have that. Uh, okay, so if I go into the jibreak, um, so jibreak.jai uh, 15, right, so there you go. Okay, I want to remove that. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so, and there is no main entry point which doesn't make any sense in jibreak the designation entry point name is main excuse me uh is that because so i set output to null so that should not affect anything Mm. Mm, 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 mm. <sighs> <sighs> okay, so I don't quite understand. Um, don't quite understand why this thing asks about the main. Right, so it asks about the main. Let me see. So here is the main. Main is in here. Right, main is completely in here. And if I try to build that, okay. Now it doesn't complain about that anymore. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, so we have redeclaration of uh, FPS. Cool. So let me maybe put that in here as well. Uh -huh. So and there we go. All right. Cool. So that's actually very very cool. Right. Because it references things like FPS. Right. But those things, they are defined in a params.config. Config. Right. So this is a params.config which is parsed at compile time. Right, okay, so we've got that. Uh, now I'm gonna go to the first dot j, right? So this is the first dot j, and the thing that I decoupled, right? So I decoupled the way of iterating parameters from uh, the actions that I want to perform on them, and I want to move them into the module that is responsible for parsing the parameters, right? So it's the params dot j, and I'm gonna just like copy paste it in here, and there we go. Everything related to parsing parameters is in its own separate module, right? So here's the module to parse, in, to parse the parameters. We use it in a, build, uh, in a build script. But now that means I can use it in the program itself. You know what I mean? I can use it in the program itself to load things at runtime. Right, I can load that stuff at runtime, which is kind of cool, uh, isn't it? I think it's kind of cool. Uh, all right, so I'm going to do it like that. Uh, and if I take a look at the uh, at the game, chat chat, look look, this is a game. Oh, oh my god, I have something cool on the screen. I'm not doing a boring code anymore. There is some pretty pictures on the screen. Isn't that cool? Oh my god, who fucking cares about that nerdy code, right? So, what the fuck is this nerd shit? Am I right? Like, this is what's cool. Holy fucking shit! Oh my god, this pretty picture, rainbowish picture. Oh my god. Zosin, how did you create that? No, no, don't talk about this nerdy shit code. No, 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 no. But how did you make that? Right. So, how did you make that? Anyway, so uh, what I wanted to do. <clears throat> 
I wanted to try to do this thing at runtime, right? So the question is how? The question is how? Um, to, 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 to. Because here is the thing. Here is the thing. The, all of these things are compile time, right? But I also want them to be um, treated as runtime things as well. Right. As the runtime as well. So that means I cannot define them define them as constants. I need to have some sort of an interface, get param, right, which maybe accepts uh, which maybe accepts the name of the parameter, right? So the name of the parameter and potentially returns the parameter like tu, like take the union. Um, what was that called? I forgot. So in params.gi, uh, yeah. So, and then it returns something like this. Uh, right. It would be nice to have this kind of interface. Right. And then you would have two modules. Right, you would have two modules, the compile time thing and the runtime thing, if you know what I mean. Mm -mm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, essentially, yeah, you want to create two modules. You want to create two modules at compile time the um, dynamic module and the runtime module. Mm. Nanomir, I don't want to be rude, but you are too back city. You're a little bit too back city. I have to actually put a lot of effort to ignore your messages. Um, all right. So for how long am I already streaming? So I think I want to make a break uh, and refill my water. So let's continue. Uh, I have an idea. I want to try to actually generate separate modules, right? So for the compile time, we're going to have one thing. And for the runtime, we're going to have another thing. So for the runtime, we need to have something, some sort of an engine, right? That also uh, holds the memory for the uh, for the strings and stuff like that. Right. Uh, so params. Uh, so this is just a params parser, right? So this is a params parser. And uh, let me let me see. So I want to come up with the name for the module that also holds the um, the config, right? The params. But unfortunately, I can't really come up with the name for it because I want to call such modules params, right? I want to call it params, uh, right? Which may be an indicator. Right, which, which may be an indicator that this is where I want to put that. Right, that is a very interesting point. That is a very interesting point. Maybe, maybe this module should, yeah, it should also hold like a, the hash map. It should also hold the hash map um, that stores everything in there, right? So, and then I just use the same mechanism both at build time and the runtime, right? Mm. So, uh, I think that's a pretty cool idea. So, but I need to learn how to use the hash map. You need to learn how to use the hash map. So let me see. Uh, so if I go to OPT, J modules, right? So this is the hash. So there is a hash table. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, but the question is, how do you use this hash table? I wonder if there is like examples, uh, right? So there's no examples for this entire thing. Okay, that's cool. Um, 
so you can initialize this stuff initialize the table um, so you know what I think I can maybe search for examples that include hash table right you can quite easily just uh, do something like this hash uh, table right there we go so this is a module for so this thing uses the table uh, right but the question is where it doesn't look like it's using it anywhere um, which is rather interesting so do you do init uh, so init sound, init textures. Uh, so let's search for the table then. Uh, so it, it just imports the hash table, but never uses it, I suppose. Maybe. Uh, well, what are the functions in there? So that means init. Does it do any other inits? Um, mm -mm. Okay, so there's not that many examples yet again, so maybe this is not what you're supposed to use. All right, so there is only hash table. I can, I can kind of figure out what, how to use this entire thing, right? Kind of figure it out. Mm. So to use this table. So the table itself, it probably accepts the key type right it accepts the key type it accepts the value type uh and then a bunch of parameters that are default parameters so i suppose if you didn't uh give a hash table it's going to use some sort of like a default one yeah there we go so if it is defined it's going to use one thing it's not defined it's going to use a completely different thing so i suppose yeah you can just do it like that. So maybe that's the thing I have to try. So let me just go ahead, right? Let me just go ahead and uh, do this kind of stuff. So it's going to be test, j, uh, right, import basic. So this is an import basic and then the hash table, uh, right? There we go. So, and I suppose I just want to have a table, right? So, and this is a table where we're going to have, um, I suppose, the string parameter, right? So this is a string. And the value is going to be the tag the union, right? So T U uh, tags union. But for now, I'm going to just keep it as an integer, right? So this is what I want to have. And then I want to say initialize this entire thing, right? So initialize this entire thing um right and uh, uh, slots to allocate i suppose this is fine uh can you then free so you can then uninit this entire stuff and i suppose the easiest way to do that is just like uninit uh table uh, right. something like this cool let me now compile uh the entire stuff right so test.j Okay, so it compiles, so there's no any errors in here, which is nice. And the next thing I want to do, I want to maybe insert some stuff. Uh, insert, uh, add. Um, so let me see. Resize, table add. Okay, that's cool. That's pretty straightforward. So I can, I can work with that. Uh, table add. So let's add a couple of things in here. So this is the table. Uh, the key, uh, let me try to add key hello. Uh, and the value in this case, 69, All right? So we're adding that. Then uh, world uh, 420. So we added two things in here and I want to print the entire stuff. I do understand that it's kind of boring, but I mean, I'm literally seeing this module for the first time in my life. like. I open it for the first time on the stream. I do understand that it's very frustrating and very irritating for people who want to backseat, right? So be, who, for people who know everything about this language, but I'm seeing it for the first time and I just like want to learn it by myself, right? So uh, if you don't like that, I don't really understand why you're watching this stream in the first place. Um, so. so this stream is sort of like exploration of the topic together right so it's not like i know uh, more about the topic than you right we're exploring things together um all right um, 
to do to all right if this is this content is not your thing i really don't know why you're watching this um it is interesting how the tab parameters work seems like this style of language wants to avoid generics i mean it does have generics <laughs> It's just like the syntactic is slightly different. I would say they that the generics in this language syntactically make more sense, right? So essentially, structure can have parameters, so it sort of like acts like a function. It's a function that accepts other types, and those it constructs a new type based on those types, right? <clears throat> Because interestingly, generic uh, structures are essentially compile time functions, right? So it's a function that at compile time takes a parameter uh, of another type and returns a completely new type, right? So I already like provided some examples like that. So you, you can have a vector, right? And vector by itself in C++, right? So in C++, std vector is a function, compile time function, right? So, and it accepts a parameter. You pass it an integer, and there you go. This function returns a new type, a vector of integers. You see what I mean? Right, integer is one type. std vector is a function from one type to another type. You apply std vector function to int, and you get a new type, the vector of integers, right? So you can think about generic types, uh, generic types like that. And here it just makes even more sense, right? So here is a structure. Here are the parameters of the structure. And then when you want to construct the um, the particular thing, you just like call it as a function, right? It just it just makes sense, right? Why to call a compile time function? You need to have a completely different syntax. Well, I mean, it's it's just a function, it's just a compile time function, which accepts types and returns another type. So for me, it makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, you can access dot, those types if you want to, right? So we can do table uh, key. Can you do that? Uh, probably not. So what is a key type? Where do we refer to the key type? Uh, oh, yeah. So we, we basically take the, the value and we extract the key type of it, right? So and it just like generates everything in Peloton. Right. It, it's the parameter that was passed to the to the table itself. Right. Mm -mm. All right. So what I want to print, I want to print the size of the table. So can I have table size, table count? So there is, uh, if we do table count multiplied by two, so the count. Mm, so I suppose the table just has the count right so which i can access which is nice so table uh, contains uh, contains these elements right so it contains these elements table count uh, and i'm gonna put a new line in here right so let's actually do this kind of thing and uh let's just do the test and does it say uh, does it say table contains two elements and everything's fine so i wonder uh there was something for the for loops, wasn't it? For expansion, right? Which is rather interesting. So I suppose this is a special macro that adapts the table to the for loop, right? I think that's what it does, which kind of makes it possible for me to do something like for table and then print each individual entry of that table. Is that a thing I can do? That's the question. I really like to, to do it like that. Yeah. For table, print it. Right. And is it going to... No, it didn't really work. Uh, semicolon. Okay, so it wanted a semicolon. And it fucking worked. It just fucking worked. Right. So I, I think I, this is my hypothesis because I remember John talking something about that. Um, right. So this is how you define iterators. This is how you define iterators for custom data structures in Jai. You define some sort of a for expansion, and the body of for expands into this, right? So that's basically what it does. But I'm not 100% sure. So let me uh, take a look. 
at some of the examples in here. So Jai and examples for, uh, they don't really talk about, this is not how to, uh, expansion for uh, default types for literals. No, they are not mentioned in here yet, right? They are not mentioned yet. Uh -huh. So let me, let me see. So it's not particularly mentioned, but I suppose, I suppose you can, we can search it in, in the modules, right? Because maybe there are several uh, data structures defined. And for all of these data structures, yeah. So as you can see, it's, there is a thing for beta ray. Um, so, okay, that's fine. All right. So far only for, for hash tables, um, I can see a thing that is actually useful. I'm not sure about beta rays, but okay. Anyway, so we have that. But the question is, what if I, so this is only values, but what if I also want to have the, um, the keys, right? How can I have the keys? So that's a good question. <clears throat> so, oh, okay. So you have to do it like this. All right. So maybe this is a key and this is the value. Uh huh. I feel like you have to do it like that. I have a strange feeling that you have to do it like that, but it didn't really work well. Uh, there we go, it worked. Cool. But it's not... Okay, we confuse them. So first comes the value and then comes the key. All right, so that makes a little bit more sense. Look at that, look at that beauty. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? I think it's fucking cool. It's absolutely freaking cool. <clears throat> transpose words in Emacs. Yeah, you can you can do stuff like that. But it's not really transpose, it's actually swap the words. Right. So it's kind of cool, right? Control T swaps the characters, right? You can swap the characters, but Alt T swaps the words. So it's it's kind of the same logic, right? It's just like a different modifier. <clears throat> Okay, so now we know how to use hash tables. I do understand it is very slow, it is very unproductive, it pisses off people who want to get things done as quickly as possible because they have... <laughs> you need to make everything as quick as possible. But on this stream, we're learning things, we're exploring things, we're discussing things, we're just enjoying things. You know what I mean? I, I do understand that people sometimes pissed off by that. Uh, like other people are pissed off that other people enjoy doing things but it is what it is if you're pissed off by that you probably shouldn't watch this stream cheers mm. you mentioned iterators in vim in the past does it work the same i think it kind of worked the same but i can't answer for sure because i don't really know how exactly for expansion works i just assumed things right so i saw it and I assumed, okay, this is probably the element of the for loop. And then I saw it index. Um, and I just assumed that means it's the second thing. And then I asked myself, can the for loop have um, the second thing? And then I looked at this for loop and I noticed, okay, it does have uh, two things. So I came to the conclusion that this is the first thing of the for loop and this is the second thing. And the first thing is assigned to value and the second thing is assigned to key, right? Apart from that, I know nothing about this syntax. I know nothing about semantic of this thing. I just like made a couple of assumptions really quick in my head. I looked at things and I checked some things and I came to a conclusion. I came to a hypothesis. I checked the hypothesis. Hypothesis was right. That's it. I don't know anything else. Maybe there are some hidden interesting things about this for expansion. Maybe them some intricate semantics. I don't care. I don't know whatever. So. Does it work the same as in Nim? Maybe, I don't remember how Nim works though. <laughs> but what, what I do remember is that in Nim, there is a keyword iterator, which defines a macro-like function that expands to a body, which kind of similar to that. So again, I don't know, maybe there are some differences in details. 
<clears throat> so, and just KGB is checking my query to the Google. So KGB approved my query to the to, to Google. So now I can check that. So here it is. Right, there you go. So this is how you do custom iterators in Neum. So I suppose it's parameterized by index. And let's see, it's using some sort of like a yield syntax. You see, it's using the yield syntax. It accepts array and then you iterate uh, the array and then you yield specific things. Um, so they are compiled to inline loops, right? Okay, interesting. I suppose syntactically they're, they're kind of different, but maybe not. I don't know. <clears throat> Mm -mm. Okay, could you be with his new? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like, it's kind of actually funny how all of the, like, foreign services are slowed down. They're just straight up slowed down. Well, right now it's fine. But if I go to Yandex, for instance, it's pretty much instant, right? So, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> But everything foreign, like YouTube, Google, or anything like that, they're, they work, but they just slow down. They usually take like, you know, like a 10 seconds to load up for the first time, and then the second load up is actually faster. So again, maybe it's just like really KGB, like manually checks it. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck is going on. I'm not even sure if they can do anything about this kind of stuff except banning it, because... All of that is the HTTPS, right? So you can't really easily interject like in encrypted stuff, uh, but I don't know. Mm -mm. Maybe because the servers in Russia are down, so you get a delay. Does Google have any servers in Russia? So that's a good question. Mm, well, maybe it should have some, yeah. Yeah, yes, it does, okay. Hmm, all right. Anyway, so I'm pretty sure it's KGB doing something. But Zozin, KGB doesn't exist. Well, I mean, they rebranded themselves. Mm -mm. They have local service everywhere to reduce the delay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so the reason why I was learning about the hash tables, right? Uh, is because I wanted to create a global hash table of the parameters, right? So. So let's have params in here, and uh, this is simply going to be a table. Um, right, so this is the table that accepts a name um, as the key and a value as the tag union, right? So you can have in and float, right? Very cool. So this is the actual params. And what I want to be able to do, I want to have function that just loads this kind of stuff from a file into this uh, table. And so then I can use that at compile time to generate baked values and then at runtime to reload things. I think that's a cool idea. Also, I should probably um, keep track of the params content, right? I should keep track of the params content, which is a string. Right, and the reason why I need to do that is because um, the strings are views, right? So, and as I chop them, right, they still refer to this memory. And if I lose pointer to this memory, um, I kind of may corrupt some of the keys within the table. So I have to be super careful with that, right? So we have to be super careful with that. So now I want to actually uh, go ahead and create a function, uh, something like load params from file, right? So it will accept the file path, um, which is a string, and will probably return nothing, or maybe it will return a Boolean indicating that it failed, right? For whatever reason, for whatever reason, it failed. And I'm going to go to the build script, right? So this is the build script. Um, where I'm going to move this entire stuff to here. Okay. So I need to replace this with file path. And 
maybe if this is not okay, I just return false. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can I check that the params are null? String has count, right? I know for a fact that string has count. Mm, okay. So I want to do something like this. So I'm going to create a variable s, um, and this is going to be string, right? So this is the count, right? This is the count. Uh, let me try to do that. All right, it's zero. But it also has data, All right? And what is it equal to? Data is null. So does that mean that there is a semantical difference between a null string and an empty string? All right. So if I have something like uh, an empty string, right? Uh, let's put it this way. So this is an empty string. And then I take a look at the data of an empty string. This is very interesting. So this is an empty string. And this is... The... Hmm. I wonder what's up with that. Is there any... The reason... The reason uh, why I'm interested in that, right? The reason why I'm interested in all of that is because uh, if params content content um, is not null, right? It is not null. Uh, I need to free that data before loading a new data. You see what I mean, right? So I need to free that data somehow. Um, so and that's a good question. How can I do that? So, and how do you free the um, the strings? Right, so this is the module. Uh, I want to find an n read entire file. So there's a couple of things in here. You read entire file, and then you just free the okay. So you literally just free the data itself. You free the data itself. All right. Maybe it is totally fine to actually depend on that. I think I think it's kind of fine. So if params content, params content uh, data not equal to null, then free params uh, params content data. Right. Then you load up the content. Interestingly, if we couldn't load the file, maybe we shouldn't free the data, right? So that, that probably makes sense. After that, we free the current data and then we reassign the content. There we go. Cool. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So this condition is needed uh, uh, just in case we load for the first time. If we load for the first time, it will be null, so it's not going to be freed. But maybe free and null is fine, right? You know, maybe it is fine. Let's actually try to do that. Yeah, I think I think it's fine. Okay, so we loaded this entire thing up, uh, and now what I want to do is I want to go to the first and start the iteration process. Right, I'm gonna start the iteration process. I'm gonna start the uh, the parser, right? So I'm gonna start the parser. I'm gonna put par uh, uh, parsing stuff in here. And when we encounter, when we encounter parameter, the thing I wanna do in here is just I wanna do table add, right? So params, uh, actually take a pointer, uh, param name, param value. There we go. So I'm basically populating the entire the entire table. Another thing I would like to do with the table as well is to clean the table. Clean, uh huh, clear, uh, clears. Okay, there is a reset. Okay, that's cool. So this resets the current number of allocated slots. It just clears. Uh, 
occupancy. It's uh, I like this behavior, but array reset freeze memory, and that is confusing. See array reset for more discussion. Okay. Oh, I remember that. So yeah, table reset uh, just basically cleans the entire thing. Does it clean the entire thing? Mm. Yeah, I think I think this is the thing that I have to call. So I'm just like I was not sure if this is the thing I want to call, but I, I think that's the thing I want to call. Mm. It cleans the thing but doesn't free the memory. Uh, yeah, so the memory can be reused then, which does make sense. Right. So and that's precisely what I want. Um, <clears throat> okay. So yeah, this is very cool. So I have a self-contained module which can basically um, load modules into the hash table. And I can use this entire thing to generate stuff. All right, so let me go to the compilation stuff. And in here, I'm going to be iterating the, um, the params, value, name, uh, params, right. And then I can take a look at the value tag. Uh-huh. Right, so this is the value. Uh, maybe I'm going to even do something like this. Yeah. Cool. Right, so I iterate the value name, and then I take a look at the value tag, and then, then I add it like that. There you go. Mm, so it's debug. It will generate the thing. So as you can see, yeah, that's very cool. And then at runtime, in the, in the program, I can use the same code. I can use the same module. That's what makes it cool uh, in here, is that I can like reuse literally the same code. As I said, compile time, I just load it into here, into the memory, and then I generate code based on that. But then I can switch the, uh, the Boolean and just use the hash map directly. That's what I can do. It's actually very cool. Mm. And the need for, yeah, yeah, the need for actually. Okay, so let me try to compile the entire thing. So I'm going to do Jive first and see if this entire thing even compiles. So uh, file path, of course, I keep forgetting this entire thing. And let me see. So table reset, we probably need to import the hash table. All right, so hash table. Uh -huh. There we go. All right, file path, uh, not control flow, something, something. I suppose we forgot the last thing to say in here. Uh, true. So if we reach the end of file, we just have to break. In case of invalid, we just ignore invalid lines for now, um, which is totally fine. All right, so uh, get param expected. Oh yeah, so it was just like a unnecessary thing. What else do we have in here? So undeclared FPS, and this is because we are in debug mode. I can't quite understand because, let me take a look at the generated strings. All right, so I can't see anything. Let me quickly clean up the build folder, right? Because I want to generate uh, new strings, right? And doesn't look like it generated anything. Mm -hmm. And declare it FPS. Mm. So if debug, true. Oh, I never actually called that. Okay. That is annoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need to load the entire thing. We need to load the entire thing. Params. So, but we also need to initialize the uh, the table. So that's another thing. Um, okay, let's do load. Uh, probably we'll probably have to load it in both of the cases, like load from file, params, file path, and also uh, ht init params like so. And let's do it like that. And since we're loading, maybe I can do something like this as well. So H2. Yeah. Okay. So H2. 
anything else ht anything else uh undeclared identifier for expand oh shit i wonder if i can do something like for expansion uh ht for expansion can i do shit like that uh apparently i can that's pretty cool okay so if i wanna like a uh, yeah <laughs> so i wanna have like a namespace for all of the functions but for expansion apparently has to be in the same um in the same scope because of that i had to do it like that and i purely guess that like this is the beauty of this language like i know nothing about this language it just makes sense uh right so that's the beauty of a good design of a language right so you don't have to learn features you can just guess how the features work based on like the logic of the whole system if the whole system is sort of coherent you can just extrapolate all of your knowledge and then guess how things are supposed to work um again i know nothing about like four expansions like in module system and stuff like that by the way module system in, in Jai is amazing i didn't have to learn it so the problem with for instance rust module system is that i'm using rust since 2016 and i still don't understand how rust modules work they are extremely confusing holy shit that's probably the most confusing module system i've ever seen maybe i'm just dumb yeah like everybody who watches me they they know that i'm dumb uh, but I just like can wrap my head around it. Like I basically memorized a couple of like patterns how to use modules in Rust, and I just like use only them and then try to go any anywhere fancier. But this module system, I just like I just use it, and it makes so much sense, and it has namespaces and stuff like that. It's just it it fucking makes sense. Uh, Box tongs, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I really like that. I really like how much sense this language makes um it's beautiful it's absolutely beautiful all right so let me see uh what do we have uh so it builds and everything is fine and let's try to run the giant break okay so everything seems to be working so now right what i want to do we probably need to i already said that we need to generate a separate module or do we need to separate, generate a separate module? It's kind of interesting, actually. <clears throat> I can probably come up with an absolutely dumb example. Okay, if this thing is that, I should probably, I should probably turn this constants into uh, into functions but these functions should be sort of expandable I think so what I recently noticed in how to uh, expand right so there is a very interesting uh, marker in here called expand right and what I'm thinking is that, so does it make it inlineable? What's the difference between expand and inline, for instance? Is there even inline? Uh, probably not. I think it's just called expand. Maybe I can turn all of these constants into expandable function. Uh -huh. So there is an insert. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to... Uh, I'm a little bit tired, so there's no expand, but there is an insert. Okay, and we see expand for the first time in here, and there's not that much explained in terms of expand, unfortunately. It can operate on code that is already... Uh, okay, so... but. So I can only assume what expand means, right? I can only assume that, right? I know it's really bad for getting the shit done. I'm sorry. 
окей. Ага. There's so many cool, complicated features that I would like to learn how to use, but there's just like no examples for them, uh, unfortunately. Though we can try to to just play with some of these things. Right, so test J, and if I define something like, um, you know, FPS, right, and then say expand, right, and it should return an integer. Uh, and then I return an integer. Will this at least compile? Right. So that's the real question. Will this at least compile when I try to call it like this? Um, yeah. So it's in the FPS. Uh, OPT bin jai bin jai test jai uh, test. There we go. Okay, it kind of works. So I kind of want to use this for the constant. <laughs> I wonder how many people who know J will be pissed off by me doing metaprogramming this way. Do I really care about people being pissed off? I mean, no matter what I do, somebody's going to be pissed off, so it doesn't matter. So yeah. Essentially, instead of generating the constants, I want to generate these things, so you're forced to do this kind of stuff. Uh, creates a macro that can access variables from the outer scope. Oh, okay. Wait a second. Um, that's actually pretty cool. Wait. Uh, so let's put 420 in here, and then I can say x. Uh, lies while expanding uh, here and declare the identifier so you probably have to insert it right while expanding macro here oh you have to use backtick okay uh, whatever okay so you know what, I think I'm gonna just use it as a functions then. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna just like use functions. And maybe hope for the optimizer to just basically inline all of them. I wonder if there is any mentioning of inlining, inlining in general. Let me see. Uh, how to inline inline assembly? Not really what I wanted, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So is the inlining inlining probably probably done automatically? Mm, the most confusing thing is that for the structure, I agree on the Rust module system. The most confusing thing is that for the structure changes what you put on the inner module. So if you move modules into inner, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, it is confusing. I do agree with that. Um, okay, so there's a lot of... Oh my god. <laughs> that was a bad idea, because there's a lot of C code in here. Okay, so I'm not gonna do that. Alright, so it can be figured out later, right? So I want to just make something that works, and then we'll see how it could be improved, right? So because the, the code is not static. A lot of people think that you have to write perfect code first try. I strongly disagree. Right, it pisses people off. Like, like it, every time, everything I do pisses, pisses people off. It's actually quite surprising. Um, all right, so let's go. So this is going to be the name, and then in here, I just can it infer the type. Can it infer the type? Probably cannot infer the type, though. Doesn't really matter because I can do something like this. Int return like that. There we go. <clears throat> so this is going to be the name, right? This is the value. Uh huh. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. Float return. Uh -huh. So, mm -hmm. so that's fine for now at least. Uh -huh. uh, what 
the fuck are you doing? Okay, so I want to have something like this. And the reason why I'm doing it like that is that then when it's um, when it's time to do the runtime generation, I can translate those calls into query in the hash table. Yes, that's what I can do. All right, so let me let me try to build into I think. Um, oh, I should have actually used first Jai. Uh huh. Okay, so type mismatch, float but given function integer. So I have to do it like that, right? And the problem here is that. Uh, oh, that's cool. Okay. So now, yeah, I have to go through all of these things and replace them with that. Okay, so this has to run. So that's kind of a that's kind of a problem, right? So we'll have to run all of these things. Um, which again is inconvenient. I'm sorry if whatever I do pisses you off. I'm, I'm really sorry if that pisses you off, but I'm exploring things. I'm really sorry for committing a, a crime of learning things on the stream. I'm really fucking sorry. Um, okay, so what do we have in here? Type mismatch. So that's really weird. Right, because it's a function target. Okay, let me take a look at the target height. Oh, okay, I see. And I probably have to do it like that. Um, cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Which does not necessarily make all of that uh, runtime stuff. Right. Which does not necessarily make all of that runtime stuff. <sighs> Okay. I feel like I want to make a break. I feel like I want to make a break. What do you guys think? I'm already streaming for almost two hours and I'm going anywhere. Should have just ignored the chat more. <clears throat> Marianne, I need to make a break. I need to make a break. My brain is frying. So let's make a small break. Um. Okay, so let me see. Uh, I've got my tea. So I need to think how we're going to approach this entire stuff, right? So you can't just have compile time functions unless you prefix them with the run, right? Unless you prefix them with the run, but that like sort of creates additional problems that are kind of difficult to resolve, right? So because like things that were compile time now become runtime and vice versa. So you have to be super careful with that specifically, right? So I want to kind of go back in terms of uh, the main file, right? So I made a couple of changes here in the main file. So I'm going to revert them. Uh, and I'm going to see uh, how it's going to go. So approach size, uh, it's defined in here, right? So an FPS is also defined in here. Uh, right, what do we have in here? Uh, approach size, let me see. Let, let me actually manually go through all of these things. So bar thickness. Mm, so bar thickness, I have a feeling that the more uh, these kind of parameters shouldn't really depend on each other very much right they should probably depend on each other within the config the config itself should uh support cross-referencing but in here it shouldn't be like that i think uh all right so what i want to do is probably go into the params gym actually params.conf uh right and i'm going to introduce the bar thickness right so this is the bar thickness and it is going to be equal to the approach size right so let's actually do it like that this is the approach size so and let me remove that uh, bar y is also really interesting so i'm using the uh, y so here it's more of a like a padding yeah it's more of a padding so 
What I want to do in here is probably rename this to bar padding. Um, maybe Y padding uh, bottom. Right, that's what I want to have in here. Uh, Alright, approach size. So target height. Uh, let's maybe move this thing in here. So target height. Uh, float is gonna be 20 as well right so eventually I'm gonna move all of these things to um, there mm, oh here we have padding X and padding Y so that means maybe the convention should be rather like this right the convention should be rather like this okay so what else do we have in here um, so type float, but got integer. Okay, approach size. Uh huh. All right. So here is the initial state. Approach x. Uh huh. And okay. So all of these things are initial states, which probably means that I can just like do it like that. Approach size should be also like this. Uh, and is that it? Uh, okay. And target height, uh, though, how target height is, oh, okay, so because I actually changed it uh, like this, uh-huh, 1 over FPS and uh, delta time in seconds, where do we use delta time? We don't use it, so it doesn't matter, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's even better actually, that is actually even better. Uh, okay, so what's that? Attempt to call, perform procedural call, okay. Um, you know, I think all of this initialization has to be a separate function that is called at runtime. I, th I feel like all of this stuff has to be a runtime. Um, I think all of that stuff has to be runtime. Okay, so init uh, state. All right, so it's called init state. Uh, right, so this is init state. And I'm going to move all of these things there. All right. So target pool. Because of that, um, this one, because it will make it everything runtime, right? Everything will become runtime which will make this stuff easier and also it will make it easier to restart right if i want to restart something it's I, I can just call to this thing and that is it right so any targets returns this thing all right so that means i'll have to put it like that uh, and in here i can just do it like this uh -huh. Mm, okay, that's fine. For these things, I can just make them uh, booleans, right? So this is a boolean. And the score is going to be an integer, right? We're not going to initialize them because they're going to be initialized by init state. Uh, sorry if the way I code pisses you off. I'm really sorry about that. Okay. So uh, I do realize that you probably need to create some sort of a structure, right? Right. Then have initializer for the structure. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that my code is not finished yet. Okay. So this is another place where we have a runtime stuff. Okay. And bar y. Okay. So we don't have a bar y. Uh, this is because we renamed it. So now it's a. Um, Padding, all right. So bar y was this, uh huh. And here, what we have to do, we have to do bar uh, padding y bottom, something like this. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Bar thickness. Did we move it here? I think we moved it here. Okay, and this is another bar thickness. Uh -huh. So, bar y. Um, 
padding. So I actually have that in more than one place, so I probably have to do it like that. Uh, which I can probably fix a bit later. Alright, so this is another approach size. Uh-huh. Padding Y. Fuck yeah. Okay. So this approach like requires a little bit of like working around, but apart from that, seems seems okay. Okay. So now let's see if I didn't break anything. Uh, everything seems fine. Look at that. Look at that bitch. Uh huh. All right. So now we are ready to do something cool. Okay. If this is debug, actually, I think it has to be not debug. I, I made a mistake. So this is not debug. Right. When we are in debug when we are in debug, we have to generate different set of these functions. This is quite important. We have to generate a different set of these functions. Uh, first of all, we'll probably have to do this thing in runtime as well. Um, but the question is, how would we do that? Mm, maybe we should intercept the compiler. Maybe we should intercept the compiler. And when we encounter main, maybe add a, like a couple of lines at main. But I don't know how to do that. Again, so this approach to hot reloading is not really final. I'm doing it based off of the knowledge that I already have in Jai. And my plan is to then update this approach and make it better as as I learned Jai, I'm really sorry that my approach pisses you off. If you have like extensive knowledge of Jai, you probably know that like how to do that very e effectively, very efficiently. And you probably know that there is a module somewhere in Jai and stuff like that. And you're really, really pissed off that this dumb Russian uh, doesn't want to learn anything, right? Doesn't want to read documentation and just follow your advices. I, I'm really sorry for that. But that's the way I learn. Something is fucked up in my brain. Something is really fucked up in my brain. The only way for me to learn things is to try to make the dumbest solution and then slowly improve it. And that way I learn. I know it's completely fucked up. I should probably visit a doctor. I should probably do that. I'm not sure if I find a doctor for my disease, but that's the way I learn. And that for some reason really pieces off people. I still don't understand why they just see code that is suboptimal and they just go nuts. And it's just like, I'm, I'm learning, I'm sorry. So I know that it's bad and stuff like that, but I don't know, people are weird. Some people, not everyone, actually. So quite a few people understand this approach, but some people just like go fucking nuts. It's just like they, can, they, they can't hold themselves. It's just like they start shaking. Like, what the fuck do you write? Um, it's absolutely weird. Well, I've seen a lot of people. So since I have a lot of people coming in and out, uh, there's a quite a few people who are just like straight up pissed off by the way I learn things. They just straight up pissed off. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't know. So, to those people, I really apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm only learning things. Mm. All right. So. <clears throat> So, and the fact that Jai already has a module for doing what I do pieces off these people even more. It's just like, why the fuck would you implement this? Which is kind of weird. I mean, like, why the fuck would you implement Jai in the first place then? There is already C++, am I right? So, <laughs> it's a really weird logic. There is a Rust. There is a, you know, D, C++. Why are you implementing Jai? Huh? Huh? 
<clears throat> anyway. So, let me, let me see. D, kappa. D is actually quite good. You can actually, there is an interesting flag in D, uh, which is called beta C, right? Which basically strips off features of D to the point of C, preserving everything like like meta programming and stuff like that right so it's just like sort of extending c but with d with its template system meta programming and stuff like that but without garbage collection and some other stuff that c developers may not want uh so so it's, it's kind of an interesting idea right so we can use d which is like a compiled compiled native java right because it have a gc and stuff like that but at some point you can put a flag better c and it turns it into c extend it with this like meta programming um which is kind of an interesting idea so this language is, tr is just trying to please everyone at this point right so which is usually doesn't really go well uh, okay so what we're gonna do in here uh, i suppose one of the things i want to do I probably want to include the params.jy. That's probably what I want to do. Right. So I'm literally just doing um, load uh, params.jy. <laughs> is, is that a good idea? I, I don't even know. I guess, I guess it is. Um, so semicolon right and i'm gonna add it to the to the workspace another interesting thing is that i probably want to add an indication that we are in a debug mode right so this is going to be debug and uh it's going to be true right this is true and since i'm introducing this thing i probably need to put this thing to false um, again, I really apologize. This is a very dumb way of doing that. You should probably not do add build string at all. You should probably generate a file first, or maybe there is a function that accepts code. I'm really apologize. Please don't get mad at me. I'm sorry. I'm learning things. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this thing is a dereferencing. This thing is a dereferencing for anyone who's interested. So, okay, in here, what we have to do, what we have to do, we have to take params, right, and rather do something like table, um, maybe I shouldn't do it like that. Mm, I have an idea. Get int param. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, get int param. And... Do I have to do... Yeah, I should probably also provide a name. And name will go here. Right, so this is the name. And I'll have to use it twice. Mm, so name. Here comes the name. And then we get int param. And yeah, that, there we go. Okay, so now we have to do float. Uh, and this is... Ah, shit. Why print contains int? It makes it inconvenient to replace things. <laughs> Print should not contain int. Let's rename it to something else. Uh, all right, so this is going to be flow. Okay, so we have a bunch of things in here. Uh, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah, maybe we should call it puts. I think it's a little better. Mm, print, yeah. Okay. So that's very cool. What I need to do in here, essentially, is now, if you are in debug mode, if you are in debug mode, uh, initialize the parameters and load the stuff from the params file path. Uh, I'm probably gonna actually add this thing in here, right, like so. So this is the params file path. So we loaded this thing up. Uh, because of that, we also need to include ht, right? So this is the first. Uh -huh, ht is it should be already available because it's loaded uh, from params. 
right it is loaded from params um do we need to do anything else do we need to do anything else i feel like the only thing that is left is to i don't know check for like f5 right so let's do case f5 and load param file right so calling this function the second time will essentially reload the param file mm -mm. and it should be only available if we are in debug mode right so if you're in debug i wonder if that's something that you can easily do right so can you can you just do it like that uh, we're about to find out actually but that would be rather convenient uh, that would be rather convenient okay case inside uh block that isn't of the form okay so you you can't just do that though we can put this thing like that which creates an empty case and i wonder if that pieces of the compiler too much that's a good question uh-huh so what do we have git uh, uh, get int param okay so uh, that's actually pretty cool so now i'm gonna go to params right so get int param is going to take the name right so here is the name and it will return an integer right so table uh how do you get okay so i never actually got table get find okay so you can find the pointer wait you can just find uh-huh all right so i will provide the params which actually provided by value which is fine i suppose the key is going to be name and then we get a value and success right and i suppose i'm going to just assert the success for now and return the value uh -huh. so you can also notice that i could could have used like a type parameter in here because i'm kind of duplicating this thing right it would be better to have a time parameter in here and i'm really apologizing that if that pisses you off so the fact that i don't have a separate type parameter just for int and float uh if that pisses you off really really badly i'm really sorry for that like i'm genuinely sorry that that pisses you off uh i'll fix that later maybe if i'm i'm in the mood right so yeah okay let's continue uh what else do we have in here table find uh ht literally female well some people will be pissed off like you you have no idea how many people i've seen i've seen people who would be genuinely pissed off by this fact right so they'll be fucking mad um luckily those people don't watch me anymore usually so anyway uh we need to extract um so since it's a value right so we'll also need to extract some other stuff uh right so we would need to do this kind of thing mm -hmm. so this is that so this is an integer uh, and this is a float there we go. okay what else uh split undeclared identifier split from left oh this is because it uh needs a string all right uh what else is it? you read the entire file it needs a file did it just work did this mother flipper just work right so i wonder if i take a look at this so are we in debug right we are in debug that means it went to this branch where it generated like a runtime stuff uh now i can try to do jai break right and it seems to be working which is cool now uh let me try to go to the params.conf and here we see a couple of interesting things in here for instance uh, bar thickness right i'm gonna change it to 100 and i'm gonna press f5 <sighs> it 
works. It may be suboptimal, it maybe doesn't use the standard Jaya module, right? But it works, and I wrote it myself, which makes I understand uh, like to some degree how this entire thing works. I'm sorry that I didn't get uh, shit done very, very quickly, and I'm sorry if that pisses you off, but I get the shit done and I learn things. Again, if the way I learn things pisses you off, I'm really sorry. That's how I learn things. Okay. So that's pretty cool. So we have a working thing, right? And we can slowly start uh, migrating. We can slowly start migrating the, um, right? These constants to the params.config, right? So we have only uh, some things in there, but we're gonna uh, have more and more and more. Plus we can start optimizing this entire process, like making it more, uh, I don't know, more robust, because right now we're generating uh, a lot of text, but I actually saw that there is a type called code, right? So I, I can even show you. I, I have no idea how to use it yet. I'm really sorry that I didn't learn it before the stream and I decided to learn it on the stream. Uh, right, so, but we can find something like this. So this is gonna be code. Right, so you can do shit like that, which is actually rather fascinating. So this creates a block of code, right? And it has the type code, and I think you can even traverse and like modify things. And you can even pass it around like this. So it would be kind of cool if instead of like strings, we would generate this kind of code that is properly parsed and properly type checked and stuff like that, right? And then we would push it instead of the strings. You know what I mean? It would be interesting for me to learn this kind of thing. And again, once you have something working, uh, extending it and improving it with this new feature becomes easier because you already have something working, right? You can apply the feature to it, doesn't work, you can fix it until it works again. Right, it is easier to like use all of these features on something that is already kind of working. So it's an iterative process. It is kind of hacky. It is kind of hacky. I admit that it's it's so it sucks so much. I like I do agree with you. It's it's absolutely horrible. Like, like look, look at this shit. This is the shit you would write in pure C. But again, it is working. It is doing its job, and you can use it as the sort of like a base for learning more and more interesting cool features about the language. So that's my approach. That's my approach. That pisses off people. I don't know why. I think it's a very effective way of learning things, but that pisses off people anyway. That just pisses off people. Sorry. Um, so, yeah. So I wonder what other things we can actually move there. Uh, so one of the things I would like to move there is callers. Right, so because uh, it will be kind of cool, like in the CSS style, to like modify colors and just like check things and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So score padding. Oh yeah, score padding left and score uh, padding top. I think these two things are very useful, right? Because then I'll be able to like adjust score and whatnot. Uh, so params.com. I'm gonna just put it in here. Uh, and these two things, uh, let me just put it like that, float, right, float like that, uh, we don't need that, we don't need that, so both of those things, uh, those things are float. Are they float? Score, padding, because I actually use them as integers, so I probably want to make them integers, right? So if I try to now build, um, uh, so what's that, first J. Right. Okay, so we have this L oh, because it's it has to be equal. So that's the syntax. Uh, right. So this is that. Uh huh. Anything else? Score left. Okay. All oh, right. That is very cool. Okay. So now I can just run it. Okay. Uh huh. I wonder if I can split some stuff to some extent. It's kind of difficult to see what the hell is going on, but I can try to do something like this. Right, params.conf, right, and now I can say, okay, 100. 
And yeah, I can move it around. It's actually pretty fun. So, two handed. Uh, yeah. I think like a round like this was actually optimal. Right, this one I can make like 50 and can go down. Uh -huh. yeah. Isn't that cool? Things pretty cool. Uh, did anyone see that? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Alright, so that's basically everything what I wanted to do in terms of like meta programming in Jai. Right? I wanted to try. I know there is a module that does that way better and stuff like that, but I just wanted to run things. I'm sorry. Alright, so I guess that's it for today. Thanks everyone who's watching right now. I really appreciate that. Have a good one, and I see you all uh, uh, next time. Right, I see you all next time. Love you all. Mm -hmm.